So we're in day two of assessment bootcamp, as I said. Uh, what we talked about yesterday was uh, kind of some basics around assessments, what assessments are, how they should be used. Obviously, today we're talking about building, uh, thinking about that balanced assessment system. Uh, day three would be managing digital assessments. Uh, day four will be talking about how do we measure student data so we get good insight and think about continuous improvement. And then day five is going to be actually a step-by-step -step walkthrough um, of our AMP platform. So that's one of the uh, assessment options we have uh, within Schoology. It's a, a separate uh, platform, uh, but we also are going to be talking about test quiz just a little bit, but mostly talking about uh, the, the kinds of questions that you can build in both course assessments um, and then also uh, in the AMP product. So we talked about the power of building uh, a balanced assessment system. Um, we're going to be talking today with two other people to kind of flesh out that conversation. I'm super happy to welcome Brian Green. Uh, he's the coordinator of professional learning for Falcon District 49. Uh, and then we also have joining us today uh, Anne Kellartinian, and she's actually uh, in charge of content development for uh, KDS or K Key Data Systems. And so I'm going to give uh, each of them just a second uh, to introduce themselves uh, and give some background. So I'll start first with Brian. Thank you, Kelly. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and sharing our experiences with the group. Uh, we were I guess rather we're in our fourth year of using the platform. Uh, we initially started using Schoology as a professional learning platform and quickly learned that it could leverage teaching time, talent resources, and assessments. So uh, we're gonna share our experiences with, uh, with the group about how we are balancing our assessment approach using Schoology. Hey, great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Anne, how about you? Hi. Um, yes, it's real nice to be with you today. Um, as Kelly mentioned, um, I'm the head of content development at Key Data Systems. And that has been my role for not only at Key Data Systems, but at a number of other uh, educational technology companies um, for more than 30 years. Um, probably more importantly, um, my parents were teachers. I am married to a teacher. My oldest son is a teacher. So I, I think every day about what's going on in in classrooms around the country and how what I do with my work with, through assessment can make uh, everyone's life a little easier. Yeah, awesome, thanks, and we're so happy to have both of you here today. Um, there's nothing like having our community also paired up with an expert in the field. I think that's gonna be a great conversation uh, for today. All right, so our agenda, um, we're gonna talk really quickly about assessment building and Schoology in terms of you know, kind of what those question types look like in a very quick way, uh, because we have all kinds of resources in our support area for those of you that need a deeper dive into the directions on how to actually construct those, because they do work a little bit differently than they do in test quiz. We'll also talk about, obviously, how do you balance formative summative benchmark assessments along with teacher-created content and third-party content third party content, that was tough to say. Um, we'll talk with Brian Green to hear his kind of perspectives and what he's seen in his district. And then we'll turn it over to Anne to really take us through why third party test banks are really valuable in terms of being part of your assessment strategy, uh, especially when we talk about what it takes to have high quality content. Uh, we have a couple of takeaways, especially what you can expect on the roadmap, uh, both for course assessments and for AMP. And then if we have time, of course, we'll have our typical Q&A, but you should see in the uh, right-hand side of your window an area to post questions in the chat area. We have uh, folks moderating that area, so if questions come up during, don't hesitate to put them in there. Um, we may highlight some as we go through, depending on content. We'll try to keep up with those as best we can. Just as a quick refresher from yesterday, we did talk about the foundational steps of assessment literacy, among other things. Uh, this actually is adapted from a text from Larry Ainsworth called Common Formative Assessments. And this is kind of the structure of what we're looking at this week. So we talked yesterday about knowing your purpose. Uh, are you using something for a formative purpose or a summative purpose, or is it something you're doing in, on an interim basis? And then deciding that appropriate format. So we talked about how there are certain learning targets that are better aligned with certain assessment methodologies, and how do we make sure that we're really being thoughtful about matching those two up? Uh, now, today we're talking about you know, that selection of content, whether that's from a test bank or creating those question items uh, you know, at a teacher level. And then we'll move on to that uh, measuring kind of part 
um, and managing that uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Um, and then, of course, we'll talk about um, the, our AMP platform um, on Friday. So uh, building assessments in Schoology. Um, we talked yesterday about selected response versus constructed response. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is thinking about which question types are best suited for us to really figure out what students actually know, because that really is the purpose of this. We're trying to make really well-founded inferences about student understanding. So when we think about test quiz in Schoology now, we have kind of what I would call the standard six. Um, and when we released uh, course assessments and the AMP platform, we introduced a whole other set of tech enhanced, uh, technology enhanced items. Uh, and so when you go into a course now, if you have this enabled for your domain, you will see a new tool for assessments. And I'm going to walk through that very quickly. But I really think it's important to mention that this, I, the new course assessments that are in Schoology do have to be turned on uh, by your enterprise admin. So if you are not seeing something I'm showing, it's not because it's not available. That's something that you need to follow up with, uh, with your tech folks about to see if they have that turned on yet. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually um, jump into a different screen here, um, which is kind of uh, your typical course uh, kind of outline um, in your materials page. Underneath the add materials area, um, instead of just having the green puzzle piece for test quiz, there's a new blue one for assessment. And if I click on that one, um, it asks me of course to name the assessment. Um, so we'll just call this data assessment. And I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in a formative assessment category and create. That part's very similar to test quiz. Where it gets different is where we have our setup and our settings and directions. We'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about management later this week. Really for the purposes of today, we want to highlight that where, you know, where do you find these questions and how are they kind of set up and how are they different? So you'll notice we've got our typical multiple choice, true, false, matching, all of those that you'd expect to see. But notice also a fill in the blank drop down, drag and drop, label image, highlight hotspot. All of these are different question types that are now available inside of course assessments. So if I wanted to say explore what fill in the blank drop down looks like, when I click on that particular question type, this screen that you're presented with is very similar to what you see in the other question types. It's just that your setup options may be a little bit different. So in here, the question stem, You've got a text editor. It looks a little bit different than it does in test quiz, uh, but really the, the basics are still there. You've got formatting tools. You've got ways to add in content like images, tables. Uh, you've got font options. Um, you can embed HTML code if you need to do that. Um, so there's kind of just the usual stuff here. And just like with test quiz, um, if we want to have a blank represented, we type something in once with an underscore. And instead of test quiz just showing an underscore, it actually says response. Super helpful. We saw so many people that would type in 10 blanks thinking they had to represent a whole blank. And then that made 10 fill in the blank options. So, um, so if I say a blank assessment should not be graded, um, then I've got an option for setting up correct answers. Um, so my response one, um, I can put this as formative, and I can add another option for summative. And you'll notice that the inter the interaction here does look a little bit different, but it's relatively intuitive. I just need to pick the correct answer here. So I'm going to say formative. And then we've got some additional options under scoring type. Depending on your question type, you may be able to assign different percentages or points based on a response. So let's say you've got a multiple choice question and you want to give students partial credit and you want it to be 75% of the correct answer points that you've made available. You can now do that. And that was something that was really frequently requested was the ability to actually differentiate those questions. Uh, when you want to actually put in things um, in terms of formatting, you may see additional setup options. Um, so you can do things like placeholder text, uh, depending on uh, if you're using an image type question, you may have options for how you want that to appear. If it's matching, it may be different layouts that are available. So this is something kind of new that we didn't always have in test quiz. And then alignment to learning objectives. We actually talked about that a lot, um, uh, I would say, um, when we were talking about aligning targets yesterday. So it's, it's really important that we explore uh, what our learning targets are and have those aligned. 
Why is that so important? It's important because basically when you align those items to standards or learning targets, those get tracked for you in that mastery area, which makes that analysis part really powerful on the teacher side. Uh, and that's really kind of what we want to get to is are the kids meeting standards and are they getting where they need to go? All right, so once uh, I'm finished with this, I can click save. I also have a preview question option in the upper right hand corner. So if I want to actually preview um, what the question looks like for the student, I can do that. Uh, but once I click save, um, now that will then show up uh, in my area of questions. And then I can drag and drop in different orders. I can add more questions over here. Uh, and then also in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that there's an option to preview. So if you want to preview not just a single question, but the entire assessment, that you have options to do that now uh, inside of course assessments, just like you had in test quiz. So we're going to actually put in, if we haven't already, a link to the support area where you can get more information. You can see we have a lot of question types here, and there's actually a lot of information about how those can be constructed on the technical side so that they are actually operating as you want them to be. So we'll post that area, check the support site. Um, they have very detailed instructions on how to set those up. Okay, so um, I just wanna call this question out real quickly. Somebody asked if it's possible to get ISTE student standards available for student alignment. Those are not natively built in to the, the set of, of, of targets that are inside of Schoology natively. However, don't forget that you've got places that you can add your own targets to track. You can do that in the group level by enabling learning objectives. So if you as a PLC want to track certain things, you can turn those on there. Or at the domain level, if you want to make those learning targets available for everybody, you can put those in the domain under learning objectives, and then everybody who is part of your system has access to those when they're aligning. Okay, so uh, moving right along. Um, the process in Schoology for building I just went over, um, but building a balance assessment system, that is a pretty critical conversation that's happening in the educational space. I just kind of demonstrated what that might look like uh, as a single teacher building an assessment. I'm in my course, I use course assessments, but really when we think about a balanced assessment system, we need to think about more than just the teacher in the classroom. So I've got a, uh, a, a, a quote here that's uh, from Chappas, Chappas and Stiggins. This is actually uh, from an article from Ed Leadership and we can put the link to that uh, near the end of the, of the presentation today so you can check that out for yourself. But when we plan, if we're effectively planning for the use of multiple measures, that means that we're providing assessment balance through three levels. So we have students who have needs, teachers who have needs in terms of the data, and districts uh, at the district level. So we do that by using both formative and summative assessments. We do with large group and individual. We assess a range of relevant learning targets with a range of appropriate assessment methods. So when we're talking about balanced assessment systems today, that's where we're headed. And then one more thing that I think is really important is that we have a lot of PLCs, we have a lot of, of folks who work together, grade level teams, to develop common assessments collaboratively. And so this quotation is from Larry Ainsworth. Um, that is from the Common Form of Assessments 2.0 text. And I really like this particular quotation about what the power is of building collaborative assessments. So as teachers learn those attributes, they more effectively match the right tool to the right job. Learning how to design a variety of effective assessments rather than relying on a particular type, it makes us more adept at utilizing multiple measures. And that's what's really critical, is that a student performance score should be based on as much data as we can gather that's really relevant, timely, and accurate for those students. So when we have teachers working together, it almost works like professional learning opportunities. And in my previous district, we built collaborative final exams in a couple of key content areas, for example, Algebra 1. The conversations that happened through that process, they were fascinating and they were very deep. And it was, I don't think anyone thought it was going to be a PD session, um, but it ended up being uh, very important in terms of how people understood what to measure uh, in terms of student understanding. So um, that being said, uh, I'm gonna actually uh, now ask uh, for some input from Brian um, and ask him about, and I'm gonna basically post some questions up onto the screen. So we're gonna have obviously Brian talking about his perspective, 
But if you want to um, also add in something in the chat area about something you've approached in your district or school, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to go ahead and enable uh, my camera, which is always kind of a frightening thing. Um, <laughs> Um, so I, I just have to call out real quick, I'm wearing my Schoology Ambassadors t-shirt today um, because that's how I first met Brian. Um, we both are in Colorado. We were both part of the first ambassador group ever. Um, so anyway, Brian and I now go back for years, so I'm thrilled to have him as part of this uh, conversation. All right, so, so you ready, Brian? I am. Thank you so much. Um, so question number one, um, for your district, how are you approaching uh, balanced assessments, either at a school or a district level? Yeah, so I think I'll start off by just kind of shaping the context of our district a little bit. <clears throat> Every district is going to be a little bit different, but you might find some similarities with your district as ours. So we're, we take a lot of pride in innovation and just being able to give teachers and educators and leaders the tools uh, they need to be innovative. Uh, Schoology for us has been that transformative tool uh, to enable uh, these innovations to take place. So our districts is set up uh, in four different zones and each zone in our district sort of has different educational initiatives, uh, different vision and different mis mission on how they're going to accomplish that vision. And so just being able to provide them with tools that have uh, a lot of flexibility, uh, a lot of variability uh, so that they can control their uh, data, uh, control their assessments, and those kind of things uh, is very important to us. And so we we appreciate the fact that Schoology does allow that to happen. And so the way we go about balanced assessments is, after providing them with the, the flexibility of the tool, is we're finding uh, that throughout our district, there's a lot of different ways that assessments can be managed and can be approached. And so we see that, uh, like you mentioned earlier, PLC groups kind of working together to uh, be collaborative and in creating assessments has really led to what you pointed out to earlier, that whole idea of uh, the collaboration process, creating those conversations about what is a good measure and what are we focus, both focusing on with this uh, particular measurement? Uh, is that a good question? Is that not a good question? How do we know a good question from uh, one that uh, isn't. And so I think just those conversations really has sort of elevated our understanding and knowledge about assessments in our district. And so we're seeing that in little pockets of different schools, different uh, grade level teams, different PLCs. And now we're starting to, that conversation now uh, sort of blossoming at a, a more of a zone or district level and how we can do that even at a higher level. So. We're, so again, we're seeing schools and different grade levels and different teams using the whole assessment platform differently. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share experiences sort of in the course level assessment tools and also at the AMP level uh, assessment tool uh, that you mentioned earlier. Okay. So um, just for some context, you may have brought this up already, Brian, but how big is Falcon 49 in terms of like student enrollment and how many buildings and yeah, good good question. Uh, we're, we're about 22,000 students strong. Uh, we are divided into four distinct zones. Um, about, I would say there's approximately, I don't know the number exactly, but about 23 different buildings yeah. that make that up. Okay. So you're one of the districts that's part of the Colorado Springs area? Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah, we're, we're part of the uh, Colorado Springs Eastern Sprawl. <laughs> okay. All right, so moving on to question two. Um, you know, you mentioned that power of having people get together to, you know, build that content and have those good conversations. Are there third party providers or test banks that you've, that you've been using uh, in Falcon 49? Yeah, there are. And in fact, <clears throat> one of the things I've really appreciated being a Schoology ambassador, but also just being able to connect with the Schoology folks over the last few years is feeling like we've had a voice in helping kind of shape this whole process. So early on, we knew that we wanted to be able to take advantage of the AMP platform. Um, so Schoology has been great about having sort of that open door conversation with us through their um, 
their engineers, through their um, the leadership team, and through other different levels, going to Schoology Next or Connect Colorado, just being able to kind of talk to uh, the people that can make a difference in helping shape this uh, whole process out. So a year ago, we launched our first district level, uh, actually, I should say one of our zone level uh, common assessments using the AMP platform. And for that, we did partner with a uh, third party vendor. And it, <clears throat> what was really good about that is, th so the feedback I get from our teachers and leaders is we just don't have the time to build our own assessments. And right now we just really don't know what a good assessment is. Right. And so being able to partner with those third party test bank vendors and being able to just import their content and then reshaping that content into our assessment uh, plan uh, has been very beneficial. It's been co cost effective, time effective. And um, this year, we now have, have taken it to a whole new level where uh, we continue to use third party vendors, but we're also bringing experts into our organization and they're looking at our curriculum and helping us align common assessments to align with the standards we're looking at so that we have assessments that fit our specific needs. Yeah, that's great. I think that's something I'm really glad to have Ann on today to talk about how important it is to see what high quality items are and kind of what that, you know, they go through a very rigorous process when they create content. So it's good to have that mix. Right. Um, all right, uh, question three, and I'll morph this into kind of a, a sub question here that's not posted, but, um, you know, having teachers work together to create those assessments, you know, in terms of like impact on students, you know, what, how have you seen that as a powerful approach? And then from a professional learning perspective, um, what it looked like for D49 to kind of get people up to speed on, you know, how do you build a good question, those types of things? Right. Yeah, so so really what we're seeing is it changes the conversation in the PLC meetings. Mm -hmm. um, it really, it's one thing to look at the data and that's very important and to be able to, to use the data to drive, um, you know, future instruction and to talk about those kind of conversations. Uh, it's a totally different conversation to talk about the question or the set of questions and thinking about, you know, what is our purpose? What is our focus? What are we trying to measure? And that brings out a whole new sort of paradigm, if you will, uh, about the PLC conversations. And so it's been real interesting to be part of some of those groups and hearing those conversations and talk about how to take th those conversations, those ideas, and then bring them to reality, really, using the, the assessment tools that are available. Yeah. And so it's really been great. And it was exciting when Schoology launched the assessment question types because they, they really provide sort of those, if you will, real tools uh, so teachers can make the kind of questions that kids are going to be exposed to later on and, and s some of those high stakes testing. So we're seeing that those conversations really lead to professional learning. They lead to higher level uh, engagement in the PLC conversations and it's been transformative so far. Okay. Uh, quick follow up question. Uh, and I mentioned this yesterday. There was an article that Thomas Guskey wrote in the February edition of Ed Leadership. And he was sort of, uh, expressing concern about the lack of assessment literacy PD that was happening uh, kind of across education and that, you know, we, we have assessment conversations about formative versus summative, but very rarely do we have it about quality, like building quality uh, measures to gather uh, student um, information, student understanding. Would you agree with that, that, you know, we need to be better about that or? Absolutely. I, I you know, I think it's, I think there's uh, a whole new world <laughs> to be discussed and discovered around data. Um, yeah. And that, I think I think there's opportunity for leadership out there, mm -hmm. teacher leaders, others to kind of, um, you know, really learn more about the whole idea of what, what good assessment, good questions, good measurements are and how that can be used to drive instruction. Yeah, it's kind of an exciting time. I mean, assessments have always been a critical part of the instructional process. And I feel like we're really getting into some really interesting areas with how we can now measure student engagement and things with technology. Exactly. Okay. Um, so uh, you've been a Schoology user for a long time, you and I both, uh, and you've seen it more from having just test quiz uh, to having course assessments and AMP. And, you know, 
in your in your view, what are you most excited about in terms of what's possible uh, with assessments now? Well, I'll kind of go back to what I said earlier about just knowing that I have a voice to be able to to you know share my ideas with with the folks at Schoology and the Schoology community. I think that's been that's been um, just awesome to be able to do that and help um, kind of shape that process a little bit. Um, knowing that they don't assume they know what we need, but they give us the voice to kind of share share with them uh, our vision and and our our needs. So I think that's been great. And um, you know, then just being able to have different platforms to to be able to collaborate with others that are um, that have great practices going on. So Schoology Next, uh, having gone to that three times, and I didn't go last year, and I really miss it. And I'd really love to go this year. Um, we started our own state conference uh, yes. called Connect Colorado. You and I worked together on yes. that project. Yes, we did. And I hear that's spreading across the country, so I'm excited yes. about that. Yeah. But just being able to just being able to kind of rub elbows and ask questions with other power users yeah uh, to be able to learn from them and share best practices uh, those kind of things and yeah. just being able to have a tool like schoology and the assessments and some of the other features that allow us to leverage teaching time talent yeah. resources and innovation yeah um just kind of to piggyback on what you said there's i think one of the things that i find so exciting right now is you know we have multiple ways we can measure student engagement and student achievement, whether it's discussion boards or it might be an offline assessment, um, or it might be one single question type that we think is really going to be great to dig into a particular concept. And I really love that all that is, you know, if it's aligned to those standards, all that data is available at the teacher level. Because um, I think that sometimes, you know, we would get all this data, and um, I think it was Rick DeFore that called it DRIP, uh, data rich but information poor. Um, I feel like the uh, I feel like the that Schoology provides a way to make that information like really relevant for not just teachers but also students because they also have access to to that mastery level uh, reporting. So, all right, right. I, I totally agree with that. We, I was just going to add to that, Kelly, if yeah. I may. Yeah. So yeah, we do have pockets around the district that that uh, really focus on aligning everything that they do mm -hmm. whether we're assessing a discussion thread or or we're we're using an assignment or assessment uh, features that are built in the schoology and aligning them to, to standards and then using the mastery because we can bring administration we can bring teachers we can bring students and we can bring parents into the conversation and they all have their view and it, it all it all helps make a difference yeah all right. Well, Brian, thank you very much uh, for joining us again. It's great to see you <laughs> remotely thank this you. time. Yeah. And um, I want to make sure that we um, now move the conversation uh, into looking at maybe what some of those third party, uh, you know, test banks really offer um, teachers. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Anne in just a second. Um, and let me go ahead and pose this question, um, which is kind of an, our lead in for Anne, which is, you know, why should high quality content be important uh, to educators? Because a lot, I think, as we mentioned, we don't always get training in that. Um, so turning it over. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so um, I wanted to start off um, by first acknowledging that um, educators have a lot on their plates. We're asking them to develop balanced assessment systems in this environment that has a lot of competing demands. Um, so at Key Data Systems, we're really focused on helping educators manage those multiple demands that they have in their lives. So um, it says, oops. I just am trying to, I, can somebody let me know if you see my screen, by the way? Nope, we can't see it at this time. Okay, can you see it now? Okay. 
and I'm sorry about this. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, as I said, we we just want to acknowledge that this is a, a, a complicated time for educators. Um, and as I said, we're really trying to maximize um, the effectiveness of the tools that teachers use, um, both in the classroom and at the district level. Um, today, um, I'll jump into the weeds a little bit. Um, to we can take a look. We're going to take a look at some specific assessment items and evaluate their quality. Um, we'll contrast um, a, some teacher written items with some uh, some of the items that are written by our professional assessment developers at Key Data Systems. Um, we'll also look at the criteria for developing and assessing high quality texts. Um, and then after that, I'll show you um, how we at KDS have we've developed a, a, a life cycle for assessment content and how that life cycle helps us develop and provide high quality content. Okay, so um, Anne, before you yep. move on, yep. we are seeing your screen, but it looks like we're not seeing this, the slide deck. Okay. So Let's... it must be in a separate screen. Sometimes if you have multiple, oh, there, that looks like it. Okay. There we go. Okay, let me move my wrong, <laughs> my wrong uh, <laughs> screen over there. I'm sorry no about worries. that. That happens all the time. Okay. So with that, we'll just dive right in here. Um, so on the left side, the, here's an example of a teacher written item. And on the right side, this is an inspect item. Now, on the surface, I want to say these items look very similar. Um, they're both related to uh, percents and ratios. And they're both multiple choice with four correct answers. Um, but as we look a little bit closer at them, okay, next, um, I want to look first at the teacher item. And we see that the standard that this is aligned to, it's a seventh grade item, and it's aligned to this idea of using proportional relationships to solve multi-step ratio and percent problems. So the first issue that we have with this item or that I have with this item is it's not really a multi-step item. So in that way, the alignment is pretty poor. Um, the second issue that I have is that some of the distractors are actually kind of throwaway distractors. So if I look at that 4%, I can't figure out what common error a student would have made in order to select that answer. And um, I also think that the same is true about 60%. So when you have throwaway distractors, what that means is you're not going to be able to learn very much from, um, from the student's performance if they select one of those distractors. So in this case, this item has a weak alignment. And also, by the way, there's no metadata. We don't know what DOK it is. Um, and we don't have enough information in order to provide formative feedback. So a teacher examining the results of on this item wouldn't necessarily have good information about how to um, work with students in order to prove their mastery of the standard. So turning to the inspect item, um, again, it's the same, it's the same um, standard. In this case, it's clearly a multi-step item. The students are first have to figure out the 3% of, of 1,500, and then they have to figure out um, how much after three years. So we've got the multi-step component. And the reason that I know that these are, whoops, I went backwards. The reason that I can tell that all the distractors are based on common errors and therefore are strong distractors is that all of the inspect items include these answer choice rationales. So if students, for example, are all selecting D, when teachers are examining the result of this item, they can read the rationale and understand the error that students are most likely making and then make really strong instructional plans as a result. Um, in addition, this item also has um, difficulty, a difficulty rating, 
and a depth of knowledge meta tag. And it also includes a tag for a math practice standard. So there's a, a lot of information associated with this item that make it very useful for um, planning instruction. So this, has, this item has strong alignment. It includes important meta meta tags, metadata tags, and the distractors reflect common errors. And then finally, the distractor rationales inform um, instructional practice. So one of the other important parts of um, selecting content, and that I gave you a math example. Now I'm going to jump into an ELA example, um, is selecting the right texts for ELA items. Now this is, um, what I'm showing you right now is an inspect passage or the, the beginning of an inspect passage. Um, and this is for grades 11 and 12. And I'm gonna show you whoop, the, the ending of this passage. This is, um, so you can see it's a 10 paragraph passage, so it's pretty extensive. It's long enough to allow those students to be able to actually interact with the ideas throughout the passage. Um, another important aspect, it's, it is uh, from the NASA webpage. So this is an authentic text. This is not, this is not um, uh, simply um, a reinterpretation of information. This came from, from NASA. It includes a great illustration. So there's lots of rich opportunities for students to interact with this text. Um, it meets the, the text complexity requirements for the 11th and 12th graders. And we know this because we attach metadata with all of our passages. So what I'm showing you here is probably something many of you have already seen. Um, but this is the um, basically the recommendations about Lexile levels for um, passages. And so this at 11th and 12th grade, you see that that we would expect the range to be from 1185 to 1385. So pretty high, pretty challenging. Um, but we do know it's not enough to show, you know, to just have the quantitative measure. We need to be looking at other things about the text to determine its text, its text complexity. So um, we we do that by evaluating the qualitative measures of text complexity. And we do this for each passage. So for example, um, there are a lot of passages that have, have relatively low lexile measures. Um, we have an excerpt from Pride and Prejudice, for example, that's, um, that's 770, that's, that's low for high school, for, for 11th and 12th grade. However, we know that it's a good text for high school because we evaluate the texts using qualitative measures. We know that the levels of meaning are complex in that text. We know that the language features are complex because it's more archaic than the language students use today and so forth. So a, a text like Pride and Prejudice, we still might put it at grade 11 and 12 because we evaluate this information. Um, but back to my passage from NASA. So each of our passages um, that are in the bank, not only do we provide the Lexile level, so you can see the Lexile for the NASA passage is 1330, um, but then we also provide this, this information about um, each of these aspects of qualitative text complexity. Um, so we're we're really looking at the the passage in in a couple of different ways before we place it at a particular grade level. The other piece of information that's really important is we also provide other kinds of meta tags that allow us to um, to look at the um, you know what text type it is, um, the genre, the subgenre, and so forth. So. This is also usually quite helpful for teachers who are, or educators who are building assessments and they want to say, find a, a text that has a scientific topic. Um, so we can use those meta tags to help with that. The item that goes with this um, passage is aligned to um, 
literacy standard two. And at the 11th and 12th grade level, notice that this is not just about identifying the main idea of a text, it's about identifying two or more central ideas of a text and analyzing their development over the course of the text, including how they interact and build on one another. So a lot of times we'll see, and in fact, um, I was just looking through um, some teacher content recently, and they would align a standard two item to, to any question about the main idea um, and, and would neglect to develop two or more central ideas, would neglect the analysis of the ideas over the course of the text, um, and so forth. So in this question, we see that there's a very careful alignment because the question itself is, is pretty explicit, which statement correctly connects two central ideas of the text. So we, we find the connection, we find the two central ideas. And with our math as similar to our math item, we have answer choice rationales that describe what a student, um, the error that a student might have made if they had chosen an incorrect answer. Um, so for example, in choice D, um, students are making them may, are con somewhat confused between what's a central idea and what's a detail that supports a central idea. So that gives some powerful information about how you can reteach or work with your students to develop their proficiency with this particular standard. Oop, so anyway, so yeah, like I said, this item, strong alignment, metadata tags, distractors that reflect student errors, um, distractor rationales that inform instruction, and it's an item of appropriate text complexity. So the next thing I wanted to tell you about real briefly, um, we, you know, the, these kinds of items don't, aren't just, they don't just come to us and then get published. They go through um, a pretty robust um, life cycle. Um, and we, so our mission is to provide informative, accurate assessment content, um, but we do it through this life cycle we have. And, there, and the two major phases of our life cycle include our editorial process, as well as our item integrity process. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about how those work. Um, so our editorial process is, a recursive, multi-layer process. Um, research into developing content has shown us that you need two or more subject matter experts looking at the same piece of content to guarantee its accuracy. And when it comes to assessment content, it's not just accuracy that we're looking for. We're looking for a variety of other, um, a variety of other things. Um, so we have three con content experts involved in the creation and review of every assessment item. We we'll always have a copy editor, and when necessary, we have a graphic designer. So we, we've created this process in order to support that mission of, of developing high quality content. Um, what one of the first things that we do as we walk down this path of developing an assessment item or a passage is we create a specification. And the specification for every item includes the assessment target. That is, we need to know what we're assessing and what we're trying to learn from the item, the standard or standards alignment, the skill focus within the standard, a topic or a theme focus. So sometimes um, in um, ELA, um, we may have uh, thematic units that, that we're trying to address, so we, we want to be, make sure that we have items to address those themes. We also want to know about the cognitive complexity um, of the item of the, that we're writing. Do we need a DOK1, or are we really looking for DOK2 and DOK3? So we specify that up front. And then, of course, we specify item type, and then finally, um, 
the quantitative and qualitative text complexity targets that we have if we're creating a passage to go with the item. So up front, we're already thinking about this. This is in our mind. We develop this, and then we move the item to a writer, and then the writer writes the item, and then it comes back for a content review, a first content review. And this first content review is very important, and it covers a wide, wide range of criteria. Uh, not only must the item meet its specification, we verify content accuracy, we really look closely at standard alignment, alignment and all of the other types of alignments. The distractors, if we cannot write a distractor rationale, if we can't explain why the distractor is incorrect, we reject that distractor and we send it back to get a, a better distractor, one that, that can be described. We, we look at the rubrics, we looked at grade level appropriateness and so forth. Um, some of the things that I think, um, so, so I would, I think that most of these things are probably you would come to expect in the review of, of content. One of the things um, that we have been spending a lot of time on um, recently uh, is our bias and sensitivity reviews. And um, so I wanted to, to dip into that a little bit. So we do bias and sensitivity reviews on all of our content. When we revisit content um, after it's been in the field for a little while, we, we kind of review the bias and sensitivity issues that might be associated with the items because times change. Sometimes, you know, something comes up in the news making an item that was acceptable in the past no longer acceptable. Um, but basically, bias and sensitivity um, is not just about being politically correct. It's about giving all students a fair opportunity to answer the question. So in order to be fair, the item has to be relevant. That is, it has to be relevant to the standard and to the learning that the student's done. It has to be not distracting. And what that means is the item can't upset a student so much or, or, or provoke such an emotional reaction that the student can no longer sort of use the thinking part of their brain to answer the question. And then the item has to be respectful. And when, when those three things work together, we think that the item has a really good chance of being considered fair. So this is an important part of what we review as well. So once we've written an item and we've put it through its content reviews, we've copy edited it, we've published it, it's available to school districts in Schoology, it's gonna get put on some assessments. And what's wonderful about that is that as soon as it gets put on assessments, we're start, we are able to begin looking at the items, um, uh, the, the student performance data associated with the item. So, so this process we call our item integrity process. And so this illustration is, a, is an overview of the item integrity process. Um, and our team of psychometricians and analysts, what they, would, what they will do is the first step thing they'll look at is how well does the assessment perform. And if you look at the orange box, number one, you'll see um, that this assessment that's being analyzed in this, in this example performed well. Um, it was a 0.77 and a 0.93. Um, so this means we're going to move on and start looking at the individual items within the assessment. So that would be the item, the box number two, the dark blue box. And so here, what we're doing is we're checking things like the p-value and the point by serial and discrimination and the difficulty of the item. In this example, the item was flagged for having a low point by serial. You see that kind of 0.24 um, next to point by serial. So what that means is we need to take a look at that item. It's not performing as well as we would like it to perform. So then we send that item over to box three. In box three, we 
open up the item, we look at the item and we say, hmm, choice B is the one that they selected more frequently than, than, than the correct answer. So do we need to revise this item in some way to improve its performance? And if the answer is, we can't fix this item, there's, you know, it's just inherently too flawed, we will retire the item out of the bank. Um, if we believe that we've come up with a good revision that would improve the item and would make B a less attractive distractor, then we revise the item and we send it out again. And then after we get student results from more than 500 students, we reanalyze it. So, um, so this item integrity process is very important to the whole life cycle of an item. Um, and any district that is um, building assessments using inspect or key data systems, inspect item bank, we, we are happy to talk with you about uh, this kind of analysis on um, your assessments. Um, so in every stage of our development, what we're doing is focusing on quality. Um, so we built that life cycle with a really strong editorial process and a really strong item integrity process in, so that we would be able to deliver to districts and educators the highest quality items that would allow them to make the best educational decisions for their students. And if you have any questions about key data systems and in spec, um, you know, your Schoology rep will be more than happy to give you more information. And, and um, so I hope, I hope to hear from some of you. Thank you. Now I'm supposed to. Okay. Great. Cool. All right. Thanks, Anne. That was awesome. Um, I think it's really important, obviously, that we really think about, you know, what does it mean to have high quality? So having you step us through that process, I know that really helped me understand um, exactly what's happening when you guys go through that process to create content. All right, so we're about out of time. I did want to bring up some takeaways for today. Um, we've had a lot of questions uh, coming in the chat window about uh, roadmap and like what can we expect to see uh, for course assessments and or AMP. Uh, yesterday we talked about um, a couple of things specific to question types, which is um, uh, the ability to upload audio or video files. Um, so that if you've got a kid who has accommodations, you can actually at least upload those files for now. The, there will be eventual integration of the recording tool that most people are used to using inside of Test Quiz, uh, but that's further down the roadmap. Um, also, uh, uploading uh, images for responses and resizing um, those images, that also is uh, in the, I would call it the near roadmap. That means 17, 18 school year mean the school year we're currently in, and then also question-specific tools. So if you want to enable a calculator for a specific question, but not have it available for the entire assessment, that will also be something that we'll see in the very near future. Again, that's a 17, 18 school year timeframe. Um, what we're looking at for 18, 19, uh, course assessment item bank support. So that's really important for the conversation we had earlier about those collaborative teams building assessments together. You can do that now inside of Test Quiz. And of course, AMP has uh, banks that are collaborative. Course assessments, though, those will be available uh, at some point during the next school year, um, as well um, something that's been requested uh, a lot, which is grade by question. I don't have that as a bullet on here because I was going to save it for later in the week. So you guys got a spoiler alert. Uh, for a future takeaway from one of our other um, webinars. But uh, for AMP also, and it's because we had Ann uh, speaking today from uh, KDS, um, item bank support for AMP is also slated for this school year's timeframe. So if you're currently an AMP customer, you can expect to have access to those item banks in the very, very near future. Okay, so, um, don't forget that we've got three more days after today. We've got uh, discussions about managing. There were people that asked about locking things down in the, in the question area earlier. We'll talk about that tomorrow in terms of management, along with some kind of best tips and tricks for those settings for assessments. Um, we'll look at measuring student data on day four um, and also look at um, 
uh, obviously AMP on day five is kind of a full on demo. Um, and don't forget that we'll be giving uh, a link to all of these presentations near the end of the week. Uh, we appreciate you spending your time with us. And don't forget, we've got Schoology Leap every month, and we've made this a special week in terms of assessment boot camp. But if you have found this information interesting, tune back in. We are on the air every third Thursday of the month. We just happen to be doing a little bit more this week. All right, we hope to see you guys tomorrow. Again, huge thanks to Brian Green uh, and Ann for joining us today. Uh, hope everyone has a great Tuesday.